Right, we are in 2 Timothy tonight, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. We'll take our text, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. And so let's go ahead and we'll read that. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and am persuaded that is in thee also. This passage of scripture has uh, some uh, beautiful passage here, Paul's emotions and his, his, uh, his, the, the reality of his family life. And what we find is that this is actually the um, message that uh, Timothy is receiving from Paul, that Paul loves him and that Paul has, um, uh, has his heart laid out towards him and he's considering the, uh, the cost and he's considering the fruit of following Christ. And that's our message tonight, the fruit of following Christ. Uh, let's notice, first of all, here that uh, God is going to produce, sometimes following Christ produces sorrow. Sometimes following Christ produces sorrow. Notice what he says here in verse 4. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. You know, Paul has a longing for Timothy to, because it's his son in the faith. And Timothy has a longing to be with Paul because it's his father in the faith. And we find in the book of Acts that when, Tim, when Paul left the elders at Ephesus, where Timothy was, that they had tears, and they had a parting, and they wept together, and they cried. And this was a great uh, a source of uh, remembrance for Paul, as they loved each other. He had spent time there, and he had worked on that church, and he had helped develop that church and, and grow it. And... You know, sometimes following the will of God produces sorrow, tears, uh, sadness. Not all of God's will is going to bring, um, no, not all of God's will is going to bring happiness. And by that I mean uh, that uh, excitement, that enjoyment, that uh, some of that following of God's will is going to produce uh, sadness. You know, it was not God's will for Paul and Timothy to be in the same place. They loved each other. They were like a father and son to each other. And they wanted to be together. And he wanted to continue to help Timothy. But it was not in the will of God. It was the will of God for them to split and to part and go separate ways. And there is a reality that sometimes the will of God is the source of sorrow. It's the sorrow of parting. The sorrow of being apart. And since Paul loved Timothy and Timothy loved Paul... It was a source of difficulty for them and as, as they loved each other. But it was also a source of constant <coughs> prayer. He, you notice that in verse 3, he says, Without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. You know, it would be possible. But possible that Paul would not have prayed so for Timothy had they been seeing each other regularly. Because of that earnest longing and that separation the time that they had been apart and the friendship that they had developed, it's possible that Paul's prayers were more sincere and more uh, deep and more earnest because of their separation, his desire to be with him. And so God, in his wisdom, knows just what to do. But to Paul, he couldn't forget Timothy and that heartache that Timothy had. You know, that probably left an impression on him. You figure that uh, it, it's hard to leave somebody. You see people saying goodbye at the airport, and you see them at the train station, and you see them, mothers and fathers, leaving their children at college, dropping them off, and the tears they shed, and the hugs they give, and the, the heartbreak. You see friends that have to separate and part ways and go different directions, and the sadness, and the, the hope that they'll be able to be reunited, but there's so much sadness in it. And it is a source of a real loss. A real loss, a, a source of real pain. And this is someone that's going to be missed, and they're going to, his, their hearts are going to be broken for each other. And yet, uh, God's will is in it. And sometimes God's will causes you to have um, a great sense of sadness. And there's nothing, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it is the will of God, and God is going to use it. But it is uh, the nature of God's will sometimes to separate people, and for the good. So we, we see that here in this passage. You know, sometimes people are separated at death. And you see uh, people who love each other, and one has to say goodbye to the other. And they cry over the casket. And there's a separation. And it is the will of God 
God chose and appointed for the person to die and to be separated from their loved one in this world. And someone who's been married for years or has been married for decades and they have to say goodbye to the one that they love. And sometimes you see them having to say goodbye to their own children whom they love and they have to put them in a little casket and bury them. But it's the will of God. And sometimes following the will of God is going to produce so, uh, going to produce some um, sadness. You know, sometimes people get saved. And because they get saved, there is a separation. Jesus said he came not to bring a peace, but to bring a sword. And that uh, in the house, a uh, father will be against a son, and a mother will be against a daughter. And we find that when sometimes when people get saved, their own family turns against them. They get blackballed from the family. They get excommunicated from the home. They get some father will tell his son, you're not my son anymore. Get out of my house and never come home. And it's because they become a Christian. And they come to Jesus Christ for salvation. And sometimes salvation, doing the will of God, brings great heartache, great pain, and great separation. But it is still the will of God. It's still the will of God. And notice what he says in verse 4, that I may be filled with joy. You know, he's going to be filled with joy. He's going to be filled with joy when he gets to see Timothy again. He's going to be filled with joy. And he says, when I, he's greatly desiring to see him. He's greatly desiring to see Timothy. He's going to be filled with joy when he gets to see him. And that is because they love each other and they're, such, they're so close and they've obeyed the will of God. When it was time for them to separate, they did. And they did so with tears. They did so with heartache. But now it is time for them to come back together. And there is going to be a call in everybody's life when they have to separate from something or someone they love. There's going to be a time when they have to lay someone to rest. There's going to be a time when they have to say goodbye and move along. And it's going to be the will of God. But the joy increases when you do the will of God. And on the other side, you get that thing back. You get that person back. It may be if it's in the case of moving away like Timothy and Paul, it may be in the case that you get to come back and be uh, that close friends again. You get to move back into the area and come back and, and be close. It may be that uh, if the person has passed away, that that reunion will be on the other side when you die and you get to see them again. And so the Bible says we do not, uh, uh, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. We have hope. We will see our family, our loved ones on the other side, those who are saved, we'll see them again. We are going to do the will of God, and we will be reunited because of our obedience. Because we have kept the faith, because we have walked with God, we'll get to see our loved ones again. And so it's more important to do the will of God than it is to, uh, to try to salvage your friendships, salvage your desires, and not sacrifice. You know, the Bible says if you have lost anything for His sake, whether houses or lands or wife or children, for His sake you will regain it all in this life and a hundred times more in the next. It is a wonderful thing to sacrifice for God, although it brings tears now, it also brings joy then. And it may bring tears today, but it will bring joy tomorrow. Don't be afraid to sacrifice for the Lord. Don't be afraid to give something up so that God can, be, can reward you on the other side. And we're afraid to lose anything. We think if we lose, we've lost. But God is not, a, he's not poor. God is not, uh, he's, he's not powerless. If we lose, and we lose it for Christ's sake, it's not lost at all. It is kept. And that reward will be returned to us, and that gift will be, come back to us. If we've lost anything, he will give it back to us. And God is good to remember that. But then we see this here in verse 5. Notice here where it says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. You know, what he's going to find, what Paul is going to point to, is he is pointing to the, uh, the will of God that has been done in Timothy's life. And the will of God has brought them to great tears, and great sadness, and great parting. But the will of God has also been the, fr it is the fruit of, of something beautiful. And that will of God is, has been uh, birthed in Timothy, and his faith is strong in Timothy because of the fruit of a godly home. God's will has started with Timothy at his home, in his house, with his family. And there's great joy in a godly home. There's great joy in a godly home. You know, there's real faith. 
and a wonderful encouragement that comes when you are seeing this uh, godly faith come out of somebody. Look what he says here again. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, he is, just has great joy in seeing Timothy and Timothy's genuine faith. There's nothing more joyous about that. He's seeing it, and he's not only seeing that real faith come out of Timothy, but he's seeing that real faith come out of Timothy and where its fruit started in that godly home. He has, he's expecting great joy. Timothy says, uh, Paul says that uh, uh, his faith, he's bringing, he's got, uh, uh, he's remembering the, uh, the, the, what did I say? I'm just lost my mind. My, my mind, yeah. <laughs> I lost my mind, lost my train of thought. Uh, when he calls to remember, it's the unfeigned faith. They, the faith that Timothy has, he's remembering it. And he's considering it because they work side by side together. And he saw it all. He's recognizing that this is going to increase his joy. You see, when you see real faith in a convert, and real faith in somebody that you've spoken with and shared with the gospel, and it's not just, well, I hope that they're saved, or, you know, I see a little spark, but you see genuine conviction and real uh, work for the Lord and, and, and genuine self-sacrifice, and, and you see the, the, the person of Jesus Christ exhibited in their lives, you have great joy in your investment. You have great joy in what you've invested in because you are seeing the hand of God and you're seeing it as a fruit and product of your own life. But then you look and you say, well, see, Timothy, he's a very, very godly man. Timothy is a very godly man. And how did this happen? It wasn't just because Paul shared the gospel with him. It wasn't just because Paul influenced him on that short time that they were together. But, you see, this is the fruit of a godly home. Paul is pointing to the fact that he has remembering a great um, joy in seeing Timothy's faith, but he knows where that faith really came from, where it emerged, how Timothy's faith became so solid and so strong, and that was because of his mother and his grandmother. You see here in verse 5, he says, It was first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. And so what we find is that there is a godly heritage in this home. And here we have this great encouragement that you may be a first-generation Christian. You may be a first-generation Christian, and you may be living for God, but our children may be second-generation Christians. Our children may be third-generation Christians, and our children may have a greater advantage in their godliness, greater fruit in their lives, greater power in their work for Christ on account of the godly home from which they came. And that's what Paul is pointing to, the, the faithfulness of his parents, his, his mother, the faithfulness of his grandmother, and the fruit that it produced. What a wonder, this faith is stronger when the families get right. It's a nursery for faith, as Timothy was growing up in a home where his mother loved the Lord, and she taught him, and she, she, uh, she trained him, and then he became a Christian, and Paul was able to minister to him. And as a young man, he got saved and became a preacher, as a young preacher, and that is a blessing. You see, some people, they aren't able to serve the Lord until later in their lives, because they don't get right with God until later, but not Timothy. Timothy was able to serve him early. Praise God for early, con early conversion. Mm -hmm. And he was able to walk with him and have a strong faith. And, you know, we need to be able to recognize that this is a, um, this is a powerful chain. It's a powerful chain. It is a mother at home who, who loves the Lord. And that mother at home who loves the Lord is sharing the, the faith with her child. And he is going to um, have this promise of growing up in the Lord and, and being different, being changed. And so then we find that uh, this mother, what's she going to have? Well, she needs to have a vision for what her children can become. She needs to have a vision for what her children can become. You need to have this, mothers, you need to think about what your, children's, what your children can become as you share with them and train them and have a vision for them serving the Lord, have a vision for them being godly, have a vision for them having faith unfeigned genuine, real faith that is in Christ. We need to make sure that we see this in our children. You know, we don't have any a vision for our children except for what they're going to be when they grow up. We, do, we need to have a character vision for them of how they're going to have the characteristics of Christ. We need to have a character vision where we're going to, we, we envision what they, how they act 
with, with in, in the Lord. How they have His, his uh, virtues. How they are merciful and kind and gentle and, and, and pose that vision into, our, into the training of the children and teach them to be merciful, teach them to be respectful, teach them to be kind, teach them as you see in their lives and look ahead and think, this is what I want my children to look like. I want them to look like Christ. And you begin to build that into your children. And you do this. You're sacrificing, and you're sacrificing, and you're sacrificing. Children have to have success, and the only way for that to happen is for the parent to sacrifice. And I suppose that mothers make the greatest sacrifices for their children. Men, we sacrifice, we work hard, and we give blood and sweat and tears into our work for our children and for them to grow. But really, the mothers, they make the greatest sacrifice. Day after day, moment by moment, they are mothers all the time. And they are sacrificing for their children, and they're pouring their lives into their children, and they are seeking to train those children. And a godly woman will seek not just to teach their children what to do, but how to do it. Not just what to think, but why to think it. They will pour that understanding into their children day after day, having a vision for their success, making a sacrifice of their lives, so that they can pour in to a future uh, a Christian, a little girl or a little boy, as they grow up. And that blessing will come back manifold and, uh, and, and full in the life of those, those, those children as she sees them grow up in Christ. You know, it is no small thing to be a mother. It's no small thing to be a godly mother who is pouring her life into her children, teaching them and nurturing them in the admonition of the Lord. She's going to be disciplining them and correcting them. And that home is going to have to be a home where the children are disciplined. An undisciplined child is going, is going to be a child that cannot discipline themselves. An undisciplined child is going to be a child that cannot control themselves. Child, children must be disciplined. You have to teach them to control themselves. You have to teach them to be able to have the self-control necessary to live as a Christian. You know, the Bible says that we are to deny ourselves. Well, how are you going to have self-control if you've never had it before? You need to have it. And the, the Lord teaches it to you, but the mother, she starts by instilling that, that ability to say no to yourself right there from the earliest days. And the godly home is not only going to have to have some discipline, but it's going to have to have some separation. You know, there are influences that are contrary to your children's godliness. There are uh, influences that are going to be contrary to the godliness of your children. We want to see that fruit coming from the will of God in those godly homes. But the world wants to influence your children also. The world wants to influence your kids, and the world wants to ch turn them into worldly children who think worldly thoughts and live worldly lives and lust after worldly things. And so the world has its way of influencing your children too, and you're going to have to separate yourselves from the influences that will corrupt your children's minds and turn them into people who do not think like Christ. And if you have that vision in your mind of what you want your children to become, how you want your children to think, the virtues that you want them to have, the self-denial, the, uh, the rejection of revenge, the desire to be merciful and kind, a desire to be um, submissive and obedient uh, children. When you see and you're projecting that into your, per, your parental guidance, and you're expecting that in their lives, then when you take them and you see something influencing them, whether it's a child, another child, whether it's another family, whether it is a family member, whether it is a, a movie or a TV show that would negatively influence that and that would go contrary to that, then you're going to need to separate from that. You're going to need to get that out of your life and stop that influence from taking place, from having such an impact upon your children. The world teaches your children revenge. The world teaches your children disobedience. The world teaches your children rebellion. The world teaches your children it's funny to be rude and be difficult. But if you want your children to be better than that, if you want your children to be godly, then you're going to have to separate yourselves from those things. And that also is going to require, require personal growth. You know, the, the, the mother, she's going to need to be growing spiritually. She's going to need to be alive spiritually. You can't just teach the precepts. You have to live them too. You can't just tell your children what to do. You have to live it as well. <clears throat> you have to fight for your children. 
and live that godly life. There's got to be a willingness to be something bigger and better than you can be without Christ. There's got to be a willingness to live for something bigger and better for yourself. You know, it is a great temptation to live to and for yourselves, but God would have you to do better than that. And so we find, we find that uh, this home is not only going to have to uh, have all these things in it, and it's going to make that faith stronger, but uh, this united home is a strong factor. The, the home being united. This is a great and essential truth. The, the home needs to be united. Timothy came out of a home where the father was Greek and the mother was Christian. She was a Jew, but she became a Christian. And Timothy was a Greek, and we don't know if his, his father was ever saved. But the united home is a stronger, stronger influence upon the child than a divided home. And we need to teach not only our children this truth, but we need to live it as well. We need to have a mother saved and a father saved on the same page, bringing the same message to the children. And we have to teach those children that you've got to marry in the Lord. We have to teach our children that it is important to have a united home. A home united for godliness. A home united for the fruit of faith. A home united so that we can see faith growing in our own children. How are you going to have a third generation that's godly if you don't establish that your children must marry in the Lord? Marry in the Lord. It's very important. And this is going to... A simple and practical step is just going to be when they're young, before it's time to protect them from what we call those crushes. The crushes, you know how kids get crushes on somebody. And they learn from that to follow their emotions. But you need to teach them, you resist that urge. Tell your mother, tell your father when that happens to you, and you resist those crushes, and you say no to them, and come and speak to your mom and your dad about it. And we will help you. And what will happen is you'll teach them that they don't just have to fall in love with anybody who makes them feel funny. That's why children end up marrying someone who's not right for them. That's why children end up growing up and marrying somebody who's not what they intended to marry to start with. Because somebody got them all fuzzy inside and they just learned from the earlier days to follow their feelings and they said, well... I fell in love. What can I do? Well, what you can do as a parent is you can teach them ahead of time, don't follow all those little crushes that you have in your heart. You protect yourself from those. Let me protect you as well. You listen to your mom. You listen to your dad. We will help you. You don't have to follow all those crushes. And somebody says, how can you stop a young person from following all those crushes? Can I just tell you, it's no problem at all. How is that possible? It's no problem at all to not follow your emotional drawings into a crush and into anything further. You say, how is that possible? Ask any married man or woman. How is it possible? What happens? You get a piece of paper, all of a sudden you don't follow crushes anymore. What happens? Well, hopefully you don't. What happens? Well, all of a sudden it's just not an option. Why? Because you've decided that uh, I'm married now and I'm not going to do that. I'm not just going to follow any crush. But aren't, aren't you just constitutionally the exact same? It's okay. Uh, aren't you just the exact same constitutionally? Aren't you physically, nothing has changed. You signed a piece of paper. That's all. All you've done. And so how can you resist all those crushes when you get married? Because you've decided you're not going to do that anymore. And so why can't you teach your children? Listen, these are going to happen to you, and you do just what your daddy does. You say, no way. No way. I'm not going to follow that. I am going to listen to my mom. I'm going to listen to my father, and I'm going to stick with them. And I'm not going to be concerned about those little fluttering things in my heart. I'm just going to trust in the Lord and do good and keep my eyes on Christ. And I'm not going to be concerned about them. And that united home teaches the children... That mommy and daddy will help you guide through, be guided through life. We will protect you. And you don't have to follow all your crushes. And next thing you know, you are going to find that your children don't have to run after the first thing that knocks on their door, but they can wait patiently for the one God has for them. Because they've learned to. They've learned not to follow their emotions and to follow their wisdom and to lean upon their parents. 
And that's going to also require for you, if you want to have a strong and united home, it's going to require for you to um, look in your, for your, in your children's lives for evidence of a changed life. Look in your children's life for evidence of a changed life. You need to be able to know the difference between the spiritual um, workings of God and the, the physical, uh, fleshly workings of the human nature. In other words, you need to be able to see the difference between the hand of God on your children and just the natural followings of religion as they follow their parents. It is not uncommon for children to follow in line with what their parents do. It's not uncommon for them to just uh, play the game that you have taught them to live and, and to, to, to do. They will come to church with you. They will enjoy church. That's how your life is. That's what they do. And they will fall in line. So what do you do? Well, you need to listen and look for and understand from the Bible the difference between the spiritual working of God in their life and the natural result of the human nature. You need to be, able to be able to discern spiritual things from carnal things. And you need to teach your children. You listen to your father and your mother, and you talk to your children, and you, you have conversations with them, and you try to discern where their heart is. Try to guide them and try to teach them. <clears throat> Parents are prone to just assume their children are saved. Parents are prone to just assume their children are saved because their children made a profession of faith. And because of that, they then turn around and say, well, I was there, I heard them say it. I saw them get baptized, they must be saved. But just because your children professed a profession of faith does not mean you can see their heart. Just because your children enjoy doing all the things you do at church does not mean they're saved. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, a great revival preacher, at about the age of 14, he said that his greatest joy was working in his grandfather's church. He had this shack that he built in the woods for prayer and he would go out there and he would pray and I don't know anybody who's built a shack just for prayer but he had a, a, a place that he would go and pray and he said the greatest joy that he had was helping his grandfather at the church and working in the church it was a great joy to him and he said but I was lost and I did not know Christ and then he got converted a little while later but you can see that children can have a great time working with their parents and being in church and being a part of it and still be lost and they can say a lot of things that you expect them to say and teach them to say, but you need to learn the difference between the spiritual uh, working of Christ in their heart and the ability, what the human nature can produce. That way you can teach them to be united together with you in the Lord. And then we'll point this last point out, and that is there, the, um, Timothy had unfeigned faith. Timothy's parents, his mother and his grandmother, had unfeigned faith. But this was the will of God and the fruit of a godly home. And this was the fruit of living for Christ. And this was the fruit of their, um, their commitment to God. But this is something that needs to be carried out right away. This is something that needs to be carried out with haste. This is something that needs to be carried out now. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back any time. We don't know if he's going to come back now, or if he's going to come back shortly, or he's going to come back in a little while. But he's coming back right away, potentially. And we need to be found at work. If we're found not doing what we're supposed to be doing, we're going to be in trouble. We need to be having our work done and getting our work done. And let me just remind you that as you're getting this done, that children just, they, they're small and they're sweet, and you have them around, but it just doesn't seem like they're around long. It doesn't seem like they're around long enough. You will find that your children just won't be around as long as you think they are. They just are here today, and they're gone tomorrow. They move on in their life. It's very much quicker than you think. You need to grow them quickly. You need to do all you can to help them. Don't skip your church services. If the church has services, come to the church services. Get your children in church. Have them learning. If there's a book that you can give to them, give it to them early and read it to them if they can't read. If there's a, a, a direction that you can have them in, then, then give that to them and help them to learn and love the things of God. Read the Bible to them. And mothers, you can read the Bible to your children. You can read it to them every day. And you can train them to listen to the Word of God. And the earlier the better. 
because they will pick it up and they will learn. My children have always reflected back what they've heard. At three years old, sitting through the main service in church, they will come and talk about things that they'd heard two and three days later. And they'll say, the pastor said this, or I remember you said this in church. And they will repeat it back. And they were listening. And it's amazing to hear what they've said and to, to realize what they have picked up on. But you need to feed your children on good material. You need to have good books for your children that will train them up in the Lord. You need to teach them to read their own Bibles as soon as they can read. Our, our oldest daughter learned to read early. We had more time, so we trained her to read. And by the age of three, she was already reading. And by the age of four, she was reading fairly proficiently. And I suppose by the age of five, she was nearly all the way through her Bible. And I think by the age of six, she read through the whole Bible one time. And that was because we had to read a chapter every morning. And so she started to read, and as soon as she could read, we had her sit down every morning and read a chapter of the book. And before too long, if she didn't have that whole thing read, and she started back over it again. And the point there is, if your kids can read, why not have them read the Bible? And people say, oh, the King James Version is so hard to read. You know, if you put a King James Bible in a kid's hand, they'll learn to read it. And they'll have no problem reading it. And they'll never complain that it's difficult, because they'll have read it from the early days. And uh, there is nothing difficult about it. It's just something that we're not used to, and everything we're not used to seems to be difficult. But your children are learning all the time. They're learning from your words. They're learning from your behavior. They're learning from your life. They're learning from the things you say. They're learning from your silence on things you don't say. They're learning from the things you like and from the things you don't like. They are learning what you do and what you don't do. All the time you're teaching your children. So you're going to have to make a great effort to teach them the things of God. You're going to have to make a great effort to teach them what God wants to do. And Paul had a men was a mentor to Timothy. And he was so happy to see Timothy's faith. He was so happy to see that Timothy's mother and grandmother had instilled their faith in Timothy. And he was seeing the fruit of it. And God <coughs> oh, excuse me, will make you so happy to see your children grow up in the Lord. And you need to be that mentor to somebody. Amen. You need to be that mentor to somebody just like Paul was. You need to make sure that you learn as much as possible while you're being a Timothy. You learn as much as you can. Soak it in. Take it up. And there'll be a day in which you become a Paul to somebody who's a Timothy. But you need to learn as much as possible in the meantime. And if you have that spirit, your children will have that spirit. If you have that spirit, your children will have that spirit. Because you say, I want to learn. I want to learn. And their children will pick up on that. And they will see your priorities. And they'll make your priorities their priorities. You ever seen a little kid who's no bigger than the father's knee? And he's got his uh, Miami Dolphins t-shirt on. And his Miami Dolphins a helmet running around the house. And he's, he's talking about the different people on the teams. Or the, uh, the Miami Heat. You know, they've got the basketball team. And he's got the jersey on. And he's telling you the different people that are on the different positions. And how well they do during the season. And you think, how does this kid know so much? And how, do they, how are they so interested in these things? Go find their father. You'll find that their father is a Miami Dolphins football fan or a Miami Heat basketball fan. And they watch it together. And that kid's so young, he doesn't even know how to flip the channels on the remote. But he can tell you all the things about that sports team. Why? Because it's a priority to the father. The father has made it a priority and he's modeled it. And the kid has picked right up on it. And I can tell you some of the things that I've seen kids be so interested in that they have no business being interested in because of their fathers. Because their fathers were interested in it at such a young age. Interested in smoking cigarettes. Interested in drinking booze. Interested in being around with women. And they're so young and they have no business even thinking about it. But their father was interested in it and it influenced them. Practice sincerity in your faith. Practice that unfeigned faith in front of your children. So the things that they should be interested in are the things that you are interested in and the things that they'll be interested in. The things that you should be interested in are the things that they'll be interested in. Practice that. Do right. Show your children what to do. If you fall down, get up and do it again. And do it right. So that your children have a fighting chance in this wicked world to do the will of God. What do you love? How do you live? How are you showing your children? Moms, you got to take your kids at an early age and train them for Christ. The sooner the better. The world wants them. 
and your influence, your influence on them is the greatest influence that they will have in their lives. The motherly influence. Here, Lois and Eunice had a great influence upon Timothy. The mothers have the greatest influence on those kids. And fathers, you're responsible to, t to help your wives to have that kind of influence and encourage them what kind of an influence you want them to have. And that will help your children grow up to be the ones who have a second generation for Christ and a third generation for Christ. What a blessing, what an encouragement to see all of that happen because somebody had fruit from their faith. Let's go ahead and pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for a wonderful, wonderful passage of Scripture. We are thankful also, Lord, for Timothy, who had a godly home. I thank you for all the godly mothers who sacrifice all that they have for their children. They give up, their, uh, they give up all of the comforts. They give up all of the enjoyments that they have, the vacations, the, the uh, personal time, sacrificing all for their children. Oh, Lord, I pray that in the midst of that, they'll be training their children for Christ. And let them work hard to teach their children how to live for God. Let them work hard to put that all before Jesus and say, Jesus, please help me to tra train up godly children in the Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.